the grandfather of all modern fantasy fiction is undoubtedly J.R.R. Tolkien's literary meisterwerk, The Lord of the Rings. The trilogy of novels and its prequel The Hobbit, not to mention all the other books and manuscripts set in the same universe of Middle-earth, has given rise to many other representations, from animated films to comics, with the most famous being, of course, Peter Jackson's blockbuster movie series that started in the early 2000s. It's definitely still alive these days, with even extra canonical stuff being written and released to this very day. Netflix has their Rings of Power series that was set like a millennium before the main trilogy, and there's even an upcoming anime film called The War of the Rohirrim, which looks fantastic. We shouldn't lose sight of just how big the main trilogy of films were. The Two Towers and The Return of the King both topped the highest grossing movies list in 2002 and 2003, with Fellowship only coming second in 2001 to the first Harry Potter film. God, you just don't get movies like that these days. Each one of these original three films inevitably had their own video games. They'd be missing a trick to not do so, and so far as my own knowledge went before reviewing this, The Two Towers at the very least was really good on the Game Boy advance. I can hardly start there though, can I? The first one of the five Lord of the Rings games to come out on this system was linked to the first film, but actually came out a mere couple of weeks before film number two, and also game number two, which both dropped in November 2002. Not to suggest that that necessarily means this was rushed out the door, but yeah, it was very rushed. And it's honestly heartbreaking for me, and probably many fans, to not do the story or the film the justice it deserves with this is kind of gut-wrenching. Put as succinctly as I can, this game was not ready. It was not fit for release in the state it was, but clearly it had to be shipped before the second one. It's horrible to see developers forced into this predicament. Pocket Studios were a tiny, very short-lived UK house that had not long been around by this point, and must have been under such pressure to get such a huge project done on time. Everywhere you look are glaring examples of unfinished and unpolished code. Nothing in the game escapes it. The game, as is the film, is centred very heavily around the four hobbits, who you'll gradually meet as the early adventure goes on. After you've watched the truncated intro sequence leading up to the bit where Frodo has to leave, you'll gain control of him as he prepares to say goodbye to Bag End, along with Sam Gamgee. I say gain control, but you'll immediately be kind of confused with how he walks about. It feels weirder than it actually is, though. Essentially, you just need to push the D-pad in the direction you want to go. Up to walk upwards, down and left to walk down and left. But it's the way Frodo changes direction that's odd. You can't just turn on the spot, but instead have to walk from direction A to direction B in a circle, cycling through the other points in between the two. So you see him start moving off in what seems like the wrong direction, meaning you reflectively try to correct it and push up or something. You'll override your instinct soon enough, but it's a strange obstacle to put in front of the player. I don't mind the background graphics too much, the different atmospheres are nice enough even if things can be a bit muddy, like what it looks like to a short-sighted person when trying to watch TV without his glasses. This isn't helped by the sprites, which are of a similar level of haziness. You won't really be able to tell the characters apart, and so we'll need to rely on the party menu a lot of the time. This is a shame, because it's one of the clunkiest, most annoying party menus I've ever seen, and as with so much else in Fellowship, it looks honestly like an unfinished placeholder, like 53rd on a 300 deep to-do list. Say one character is carrying a weapon that you want to equip on another, you have to first press L to select the character as your lead, cancel out, press R to access his inventory, select the item, then give, then cancel out, press L to make the other guy your lead, then R again to equip the item. Suffice to say, none of these steps are particularly speedy. This becomes a major irritant when trying to heal your party after a hairy fight. You can only see a character's HP by having their inventory screen open, but if, say, Samwise is holding all the healing mushrooms, you can imagine just what a ball ache it is trying to work out who needs them. So much switching around. The music is coded very strangely. Again, it feels totally unfinished. Compositionally, the snatches of songs are fairly simple, but set a nice atmosphere in that kind of synthesized neo-folk way. Lots of strings, pipes, and so on. But that's not really what I'm talking about. It loops at weird, jarring places in the song, if at all.
Every now and then, the music will just stop entirely for a good minute or two before picking up again. There are no logical song transitions when you shift areas or even when you start a battle. You could get into an encounter with an enemy, and the same lilting whistle and pizzicato harp ditty from the overworld is playing over the top of it. Very odd indeed. However, the song will just randomly change into another with no rhyme or reason occasionally. Not very immersive, I dare say. In the overworld, there aren't what you'd call random encounters, as in theory, every potential fight is already visible. Having said that, you don't actually need to get all that close to an enemy for it to challenge you to a scrap. There are sometimes opportunities to avoid the battles, but it's contingent on you being able to make out the monsters from the noisy mess of some of the environments. When it's a humanoid or animal, they're moving about typically, and so it's a bit easier, but when you're in a forest, for example, the angry plants are very tough to distinguish. If you can avoid the battles, I'd strongly recommend doing so. This has to be the single most lethargic battle sequence I've ever seen. Enemies will always get the jump on you straight away. None of this calculating which one has a faster speed stat or anything, it doesn't apply here. Each enemy will always get one attack off before you even get a go, and this is regardless regardless of whether you or they get the jump on the other. The enemies and the hobbits' battle lines are a good distance apart, and to perform any close-range attack, which most of them are, the attacker will slowly, and I mean slowly, dawdle across the distance, do the attack, then dawdle back to the ranks. This takes an absolute age, and you can only imagine how long this takes if there are four or five or more enemies to fight. I ended up using the weaker slingshot to attack just because Frodo could do that from where he was stood and didn't have to walk anywhere. Plus, and I suppose this is kind of realistic, but it's still annoying, your hobbits have absolutely rubbish accuracy. Seriously, something like 50% of your attacks will just straight up miss. It's not uncommon for the entire row of four to all completely miss a wolf with one HP, and then you have to sit through another turn. There are finite enemies. Once they're dead, they don't respawn. You don't really need to fight the battles to get stronger anyway, it's not that sort of RPG. There is a leveling up system in this game, but it'll take someone smarter than me to decipher it. You don't level up after fights, but after events in-game. Frodo can level up, for example, by defeating a random scarecrow, Sam by bringing some old boots to a dwarf in an inn, Pippin by not stealing any mushrooms. If you don't do the things, you don't get the level ups, and they're usually gone if you miss them or do something wrong. Eventually, you can meet the other five members of the Fellowship, Gandalf, Aragorn and all them, but there's no way I'm going that far into the game again to see if they're any better in combat. I would have done, and I almost did, but for the main issue with why this game was not ready for release. And this is not a frivolous problem, it's actually kinda game-breaking. There are several instances, note the word indicating it's not a rare occurrence, where the game will completely freeze and become totally unresponsive. Note, I'm not saying a soft lock, you get music playing, but there's nothing you can do to get your characters to move at all. None of the menuing works or anything, you're just frozen. Make sure you save all the time, particularly before battle. It seems to happen most of all when returning to the overworld after a fight or a cutscene or something. The first playthrough I did, I got halfway through the mysterious forest when I just finished this side quest to clear someone's house out from spiders. Once the last one was dead, the game just completely froze. This was around two hours in and me being me, I hadn't saved the game yet. No option but to start all over again. I was more vigilant after this, but there are other similar completely game-breaking bugs in Moria and Rivendell, two vital plot points that you really wouldn't want to have to grind all the way towards again. They're not isolated incidents on my part either. Look at any message board from around the early 2000s to read tons of complaints about how broken this all is. It's all stuff that would be picked up so easily had there been time for decent QC, but there clearly wasn't. And it's not like now where you could just patch this stuff out. Still think cartridges were better? In theory, perhaps, but when you've got a studio pressurizing you to get your game out there, probably not. Honestly though, even were the game in a more playable state, it still wouldn't be super compelling. I love the first book and movie, but it's hard to deny that a lot of it is just some dudes walking about for a bit. It's great for the world building stuff that the two more exciting books later on rely on, but do you want that in a video game? It's taken to obnoxious levels here as well. You'll be traipsing back and forth, dropping this off, relaying that message, finding this horse, and so on. There's just so little to do. Interactivity with the game stripped to a complete bare minimum. 
battles are boring and far too long in between, and as a juxtaposition, the storyline bits feel incredibly rushed and crammed in. There's no tension or drama. Even when you see a ring wraith, all you get is some silly music and an, oh no, we can't go that way, there's a black rider. Absolutely gutted with this whole affair, especially with how buggy and messy it is. Oh well. It just makes me appreciate the other two main series games even more.